the founding director of the Headache and Facial Pain Program and Cerebrospinal Fluid Dynamics Program at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She is board certified in neurology and headache medicine and is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, American Headache Society, American Neurological Association, and the North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society. She served on the board of directors of the American Headache Society and the Southern Headache Society as a past president of NANOS and on the steering committee for the idiopathic intracranial hypertension treatment trial. She has published over 130 articles in peer-reviewed journals and 27 book chapters. Her key interests are intracranial pressure disorders, cluster headache, and migraine. Please, everybody, help me welcome Dr. Deborah Friedman. We're good to go. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. White, for inviting me. Um, I'm just really thrilled. Okay, here we go. Um, these are my disclosures. There um, is nothing really that's relevant as far as industry, um, but I did receive a, a grant from the Spinal CSF Leak Foundation to do a research project that I'll tell you about today, um, and I'm on their medical advisory board. So I don't even have to use this, I can look up there. Um, so I'd like to start actually with some cases because intracranial hypotension really has a variety of presentations. Um, and so the first case is a 31 year old woman and she uh, came in because she'd experienced double vision and intermittent headaches. But after about two weeks, the headaches became constant. And she saw an optometrist, he found a right abducens palsy um, and did a CT of the orbits that was normal. Um, I saw her a couple of months later, and at that point, she was having right temple pain uh, with intermittent burning on her right cheek and ear. Everything was on the right side. Um, she had some uh, pain behind her eye on the right side um, and some pain in her neck as well. And, and she also experienced really severe sensitivity to light, uh, mild sensitivity to noise, nausea, uh, confusion, and dry heaving. And she said that when she woke up in the morning, she would rate her pain about a four out of 10 in intensity. By the end of the day, it was an eight out of 10 in intensity. It got worse with any Valsalva maneuver, coughing, sneezing, bearing down, um, and it improved only when lying flat or with caffeine. Um, and she had a normal MRI of the brain with contrast. And by the way, all of these people turned out to have CSF leaks. Um, the second case is a 61-year-old former directory of treasury, uh, that's a Dallas term, I guess, I had never really heard that before, um, for a large company, and he had a three-year history of cognitive decline, uh, and his wife noticed something was wrong when he stopped, he was missing paying bills, which is really not a good thing when you're the directory of treasury. Um, he was found sleeping at his desk, he forgot how to log onto his computer, um, he couldn't remember what day of the week it was, and his headaches only started a couple years later and they were nearly not a big problem for him. They occurred a couple of times a week. Um, they were mostly at the top of his head, the back of his head, the neck. Um, there was a little photophobia, but no other migraine-like symptoms. They were they lasted about 30 to 60 minutes and easily relieved with acetaminophen. Um, no change with posture, no change with Valsalva. Uh, he didn't have any uh, vestibulocochlear symptoms, but his wife just noticed he was walking more slowly. And he had been seen in the memory clinic, actually had been scanned several times. Uh, nobody really did anything about it, um, but finally somebody referred him to the headache clinic. Uh, and he just kind of sat there pleasantly smiling while his wife related the entire history because he couldn't do it. Um, so you can hopefully see that this is not a normal brain MRI. Um, this is a sagittal T1. You can see there's straightening of the optic chiasm. The whole midbrain is slumped down on top of the pons. Um, there's flattening of the anterior pons, um, narrowing of the prepontine cistern, which you'll see better on the axial, and then pretty marked tonsillar descent. Um, on the axial view, you can't even see the prepontine cistern. Um, and this, there's a uh, high uh, flare signal over here, probably kind of a, in the region of the hippocampus, which might explain his memory problems. Um, case three is a 65-year-old retired professor of nursing. Uh, she had a persistent headache following a spinal tap several years before. So this was not spontaneous. This was actually iatrogenic. Um, and she described a headache that was worse with any positional change, 
uh, was bifrontal, aching. When it was bad, she would vomit. About six months after the headache started, she developed this generalized shaking and also generalized weakness to the point where she had to use a walker. She was diagnosed with meningitis somewhere else um, when her MRI showed meningeal enhancement and uh, was treated with IVIG and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was, she came from out of state. Um, she also had memory problems and she volunteered that her memory was actually better in the morning than it was once she was up and around. She was off balance and falling. And this got to be so problematic that she moved in back home with her 92 year old mother who was taking care of her. So um, I'm gonna show you her video, but you know, when I was uh, back in the days when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, when I did my neurology residency, they told us that spinal headaches, spinal tap headaches always went away no matter what you did within two to three weeks. That is not true, okay, take home message. So she saw a um, movement disorder specialist who really diagnosed her as that. having functional neurologic disorder. You and you, you, when you see her walk and you see her hands right. kind of flap, I think you'll understand why that happened. Um, but this is not that abnormal. And that funny expression on hand? her face is like not a, her normal expression either. So a little finger to nose thing going on here. And then Good. she'll get up and she'll walk for you. Now the one thing I think that's a tiny bit odd is when I lie down. And she's saying I'm funny, sure. all these things are better in the morning. They get worse as the day yes, go, it goes on. You know, that does kind of look functional. Great. Come on back. A little flappy tremor. This is not all that uncommon. I've seen several patients who have had this. 46-year-old um, woman, orthostatic headaches for 10 years. Um, they don't start until she's upright for six or seven hours. Uh, it rates them a seven out of 10 in intensity. They're at the top of her head, sharp, associated with neck pain. Uh, photophobia, constant ringing in her ears, but when she wakes up in the morning, she also gets pulsatile tinnitus. Um, her headache is daily and constant. The only thing that makes it better is sleep or being at high altitude. Um, and she's also got what we call a coat hanger headache. So she's got occipital pain with pain between her shoulder blades. Um, and then that pain that kind of radiates up her head and burning neck pain. About a year before she saw me, she woke up two days in a row with what she described as a wet ear. And when she got up and looked at her pillowcase, there was this like halo of blood and clear liquid around it. Um, and her headaches got worse after that. And she'd actually been evaluated for a skull-based CSF leak in the past, and that evaluation was negative. Uh, but she had headaches, and so she was started on topiramate. Um, five years ago, she'd been evaluated for high pressure, for IIH, um, and she had a normal LP opening pressure. So that was ruled out. She had a CT myelogram that showed a bunch of perineural cysts. I'll show it to you. Um, and she had a non-targeted blood patch after her first visit and had relief of her headaches for a month. Um, so here's her brain MRI and she has no brain sag, right? She's got a pretty good looking posterior fossa here. That's what your midbrain's supposed to look like. Um, but when you look over here at her cella, she's got pituitary flattening. And that's not what you would expect with a CSF leak, you would actually expect there to be an engorged pituitary gland. Um, and when you look at her axial T2 weighted images, you can see she's got a little too much spinal fluid over here um, around her optic nerves, which is more typical for high pressure than low pressure, even though her story certainly sounds like low pressure. Um, she has a history of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which we think about with low pressure. Um, she's a little overweight, but not, you know, uh, not obese. Um, her optic nerves look totally normal and she had spontaneous venous pulsations on her exam, which tells us that her intracranial pressure is normal. And she had a normal neurologic exam, but when I put her in Trendelenburg, in about 10 minutes, her headache got better when her head was lower than her feet. Um, so she had all of these perineural cysts. There's one over there, there's one over there, they're huge. Um, but there's this big one over here down at T10. Um, and that was the one that we targeted. And she had relief after that. Um, uh, she came back and she saw my nurse practitioner and said, well, maybe you shouldn't be on topiramate because we think you have low pressure, not high pressure. Topiramate is going to lower your intracranial pressure. So she came off topiramate um, and she continued to have blood patches every month or two or three uh, as needed to answer your question from last night about how often can you do these. Um, after her last blood patch, 
she developed a different kind of headache. It's kind of like when you go skiing after the last run, it's the last run of the day, that's when you get your ski injury, right? Um, and this headache was totally different. It was worse with lying flat. And she would wake up with that headache and then 10 or 15 minutes after being upright, that headache would go away and then her previous orthostatic headache would come back four hours later. So she's kind of having like symptoms of high pressure and symptoms of low pressure. Um, more history. Stopping topiramate may not have been the greatest idea because she gained 30 pounds after she stopped it. Um, and then she related that she had this lifelong history of transient visual loss every time she stood up, which sounds like high pressure. Um, and now her optic nerves don't look normal anymore. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to see in the light, but she's got some, I think hopefully see that her disc margins over here, nasally in the right eye are kind of indistinct. There's a little bit of a halo around the nerve. Um, and there was a little elevation uh, nasally that wasn't there prior. Um, so she went from low pressure symptoms to high pressure symptoms. Uh, and we turned out we could fit, we fixed her low pressure uh, leak problem. Then she developed high pressure and we had to treat her for high pressure. Um, so you can see that the presentation of a leak is kind of all over the place. So, um, the, I didn't go over the patient with the severe photophobia just because of the time. Um, but I had a patient that basically was living in the dark because her, her light sensitivity was so bad from her leak. This functional tremor, burning pain in your neck, dementia, six nerve palsy, facial pain. It just causes so many different things. So SIH is kind of a misleading name. Um, it's not always totally spontaneous. Sometimes we see this in patients who have had just really trivial trauma or they valsalva it and cough too much or they vomited. Um, it's not intracranial, okay? It's from the spine, it's from a leak in the spine. And the CSF pressure is not always low. And in fact, um, there was a nice study that was done at Duke showing that the CSF pressure was only low about a third of the time um, in the patients that they studied. Um, so it's a lot more common than we think it is. These patients are probably in your practice somewhere. Um, and it's really important to ask the right questions and realize that even though our, our technology has gotten better and our treatments have gotten better over the past 10, 15 years, um, only 70% of the patients are what we would consider typical. So the problem is unless you diagnose the patient, you can't treat them appropriately. Um, and the patients that we see as neurologists are not really the same patients that the neurosurgeons see. And they're not the same patients that the neuroradiologists see, unless, of course, we're the ones that send them. Um, so you really need to be a detective, which is what we do in neurology. Um, so this comes from a leak um, from a dural defect somewhere along the spinal axis. Um, and they, uh, assuming that it's not iatrogenic or traumatic, usually it's in the cervical spine or in the thoracic spine. Uh, and again, it, you can do a case report if you see one that arises from the the base of the brain, because that's where this picture is from. There's a less than like five patients reported in the literature that have this syndrome from a, a skull base leak. Um, so this one uh, actually was reported by Wouter Schievink um, that uh, arose from a patient who had a posterior cranial fossa skull base defect. Um, and there was CSF entering the posterior fossa from the cervical spinal canal and then leaking into the soft tissues of the neck. But this is very, very, very unusual. Um, it's more common in females than males. The peak incidence is said to be around age 40, but this can happen at any time during life. Um, it, the annual incidence is at least five per 100,000. Our numbers are not great because until about 2020, I think, or maybe it was 2022, it was 2020, we didn't have a diagnosis code, right? There was no specific diagnosis code, which makes it really hard to determine uh, the incidence and the prevalence. And this can go undiagnosed for many years. Um, the, the record that I've heard of is somewhere along the lines of 70 or 80 years. Someone that had this when they were young and were not diagnosed until they were like in their 70s or 80s. Um, so it's one of those things that we always think about when we see patients who have refractory chronic migraine, nothing works for them. Um, maybe they, the problem is not so migraine. About, maybe the problem is not migraine. Um, the things to think about that kind of go hand in hand with this are patients who have joint hypermobility. Um, and they just may say they're double jointed. They may not be diagnosed with Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos or any of those things. 
And as we get older, uh, we are a little less mobile than we used to be when we were younger. So ask about hypermobility in childhood. Uh, were these people on the gymnastics team? Were they cheerleaders? Were they ballet dancers? You know, could they wrap their leg around their head? Um, they may have had a trivial trauma. And a lot of times it's something people don't even think about. Moving furniture, doing yoga, um, you know, uh, burpees, as Linda Gray would say. Um, history of previous spine surgery, um, disc disease, spinal disc disease um, that can cause ventral spinal fluid leaks. Um, anything that would cause a dural puncture, previous LP, epidural anesthesia, very common actually uh, for this to arise after having an epidural, spinal anesthesia, history of spontaneous retinal detachment, or even a history of intracranial hypertension. Um, and so this is just from a paper looking at IIH causing spinal fluid leaks, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing other than to say it's usually a skull base leak that it causes because it erodes the base of the skull. Um, and often these patients have really no other symptoms or signs of IIH. Um, and the reason is because they're basically self decompressing, right? They, they blew a hole in their dura or in the bone at the base of the brain. Um, so even though they, the underlying problem is high pressure, they're not manifesting high pressure, they often do not have papilledema, um, but sometimes as the patient you saw showed, they will have manifestations on their MRI scan that give you a clue that maybe the underlying problem was actually high pressure before they blew out their dura and got low pressure. Um, spinal CSFs may occur, they're just, they're not well reported in the literature. Um, so what about the headache? Not everybody has a headache. Most people do, over 90% with, with SIH have a headache, um, and it's usually an orthostatic headache. It's worse when they're upright, it's better when they lie down. Um, think about this in people who come in with new daily persistent headache. So it's somebody who either never had a headache or they had a headache, but they developed this new headache that's totally different and it never went away. And often they can tell you exactly when it started, what they were doing, um, and it's a really intractable headache. Um, sometimes the headache starts as a thunderclap headache. It just comes on suddenly, like a clap of thunder. Um, it's most commonly posterior in the occipital area, uh, but it also often involves the neck and the, the area between the shoulder blades. It can involve the face as well. Pain is usually bilateral, but not always. So there's no specific character. There's no specific severity. Um, occasionally hear about a paradoxical headache. So instead of being worse when upright, it's worse when they're lying down and better than when they're upright. That's not very common. Um, but over time, that postural component tends to go away. Um, so most typically, it's orthostatic when it first starts. As time goes on, they just have a headache um, that never really changes much. It can be intermittent. It can be there all the time. It can wake people up from sleep. And it took me a long time to wrap my head around this, no pun intended, um, because why would it? do that well your pressure goes up at night right your spinal fluid pressure goes up well it goes up when you're recumbent for a long period of time um, and so that may predispose people to leak um, it is often worse with exertion and with valsalva um, and it may improve with high altitude that is just my personal experience with these patients it's not in the literature other symptoms besides the the symptoms that go along with migraine uh, and headache, the next most common is vestibular cochlear symptoms. So tinnitus, abnormal, muffled hearing, feeling like I'm underwater hearing, loss of balance, spinal symptoms, that neck pain, the interscapular pain. Um, some people get chest pain, some people get radicular pain, um, and other people can get pain at the site of the leak, very focal pain along their spinal axis. Um, blurred vision, pretty common. Visual field defects are rare, um, and diplopia is not super common, but it can happen. Um, you can see there's a whole list of things, facial palsies, facial pain, movement disorders, either hypo or hyperkinetic. Usually it's a Parkinson-like movement disorder. Um, cognitive problems from anywhere from brain fog to dementia. Um, coma, and those are the people that go to the neurosurgeons. Uh, I've never seen a patient who had galacteria, but it's been reported. Subdural fluid collections, again, those people, the intracranial hemorrhages, they'd probably go, be seen by the neurosurgeons as well. Um, change in taste, uh, 
trouble swallowing, and basically any cranial nerve can be involved. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you some data from a big meta-analysis. Uh, they looked at uh, almost 7,000 articles, used the data from 144 of them that met their criteria. Um, and here's what they found as far as presenting symptoms. Um, so the most common, almost in 100%, was orthostatic headache, followed by nausea and vomiting, then neck pain, um, then other ear-related symptoms like uh, tinnitus and, and muffled hearing. Um, and then you get a, a few more vestibulocochlear symptoms and then uh, on to reduce level of consciousness and some others that are kind of uncommon. Um, so when you're examining these folks, you're not gonna really find much. They generally have a normal exam, unless they have a functional tremor or Parkinsonian symptoms, um, but you're gonna look for uh, joint hypermobility. Um, so there's a whole series of tests you can do. It's called the Byton scale. Um, where you have people like bend their thumb back and do all kinds of stuff to see if they have joint mobility. Um, for me, I use the yoga shoulder wrap. If anybody can do that, to me, they have joint hypermobility. Maybe it's just because I can't do that. Um, but the other thing that, that we're going to do is a Trendelenburg test. And you put the patient in Trendelenburg, about 5 or 10 degrees of Trendelenburg, uh, for about 5 or 10 minutes and see if they get better. Some people get better almost immediately. But basically, we're kind of looking for the Cirque du Soleil uh, profile. Um, so the first test that we do as far as their workup is an MRI with gadolinium of the brain. Um, but this is only abnormal in about 75 to 80% of people. Um, so an, a normal MRI of the brain with GAD, it has to be with GAD, does not rule this out. Um, so the main thing we're looking for is dural enhancement. And I'll show you some more slides that, um, that show this. Um, but sometimes you'll see, as you can see over here, some subdural fluid collections. Um, we see engorgement of the venous structure. So you can see this should be triangular in shape um, or all those uh, uh, cerebral uh, venous sinuses come together. But you can see that it's round. Um, and also that pituitary hyperemia and pituitary enlargement, sometimes mistaken for a pituitary tumor. Um, so here are examples of the dural enhancement. It's a smooth enhancement. It goes all the way around. It's contiguous. Um, Bara Mokri described this like taking a, a felt tip marker and just drawing a line around the dura is kind of what it looks like. Um, and the reason you get this is because of the venous engorgement, um, because it's the veins that take up the contrast. Uh, and this is the most common sign. Uh, it tends to go away over time. So if you don't catch the person early on their course, you may miss it. Um, the uh, other signs you're going to look for are signs of brain sag. Um, so again, you can see that in this patient, there is flattening of the anterior pons. Um, there's narrowing of the prepontine cistern. Um, they have a large pituitary gland. Again, you can't even see the midbrain. It's just slumped all over on top of the pons. Um, and then uh, this tonsillar descent in the posterior fossa. Um, and I don't think there's anything really different on this one that you couldn't see in the last one. Um, descent of the mammillary bodies, and then like we saw in that patient uh, who was had the cognitive dysfunction, straightening of the optic chiasm. So the optic chiasm, um, I have a better picture that, no, that's a, that is the picture, it's just hard to see. The optic chiasm over there, it looks like it's parallel to the ground. It should be at an angle, okay? Should, if your chiasm goes upward as it goes, um, your, your visual pathways go upward as they go to the back of your brain. Other things that can be present, um, non-aneurysmal non subarachnoid hemorrhage, think about a leak, um, hyperostosis of the bones of the skull, um, and uh, this has been reported, and I have a picture of it somewhere, it's over here, it's called the layer cake appearance uh, with this hyperostosis, the opposite of what you see with high pressure, where it thins the bone, sagittal sinus thrombosis, uh, superficial siderosis. There's a picture over here, and uh, all these little dark things are hemosiderin. Um, you can sometimes see this in the spine. This is very rare. If the patient's never had a history of a, a central CNS hemorrhage, think about uh, this condition. Okay, so spinal imaging. I'll talk about kind of how I think about working up these patients, but the next step after brain imaging might be spinal imaging. So there are a lot of options for us. And honestly, I think this really depends on what you have available where you work. Um, and so often we'll start with CT myelography, um, but you could also do an MRI. So CT myelography, um, 
is preferentially done um, is in what we call a dynamic CT myelogram. So the patient is injected with the dye. Basically, they do a lumbar puncture. They inject iodinated contrast dye with the patient on the CT gantry and then either have the patient sort of go into bridge pose like you do in yoga or um, bolster their, uh, their feet with a, um, a pillow and have them so the, uh, their head is down and so the, um, the dye can go towards their head because the CT gantry doesn't tilt. Um, but when you do it that way, the patient's already on the gantry and you can rapidly image them. Um, well, the way they usually do CT myelography is they will it, inject the dye under fluoroscopy, often in a different room. And then they have to bring the patient into the CT scanner. And sometimes you'll miss leaks because time has elapsed uh, during that time. Um, you can, the patient's usually done in the prone position, uh, but sometimes if you're looking for a fistula, an abnormal connection between um, a, one of those little uh, cysts like you saw on that lady's uh, image, and an adjacent vein, it's called a CSF venous fistula, they tend to be more lateral. Um, so you can have the patient in the lateral decubitus position to look for those under CT. MRI, uh, you can do one of two ways. Uh, the most common way is to have heavily T2 weighted images with fat suppression. And you really need to specify that you're looking for a CSF leak. And I always specify heavily T2 weighted MRI because I'm looking for a, C2, a, a CSF leak and the standard spinal MRI doesn't include these sequences. Okay, so it's really, really, import really important to specify those. Um, you can also do, uh, if you're brave, MR myelography with intrathecal gadolinium. Now, this is an off-label use of gadolinium, um, but many centers do it. Our center used to do it. Um, and you can also inject a little more saline if you want to, to like see if they'll leak for you while they're in the scanner. Um, and then kind of the higher end of imaging is called digital subtraction myelography. This is done using technology that's similar to a cardiac cath. Um, so it's done under, under fluoroscopy um, and it's sort of a constant, the roll of the film constantly essentially, although there's no film anymore. Um, so the, the series of sequences uh, and pictures are taken in very, very rapid succession. Um, and you can actually, you know, see uh, in with very good detail, the dye that's going up in the spinal canal and whether it's leaking out anywhere. The downside of this is that you need to know where you're looking um, because you can't image the entire spine with digital subtraction myelography. Um, and you may need to bring the patient back for a second round, depending on if you're gonna start with them in the lateral decubitus position or start in the prone position. And there's only so much you can do in one day. Um, radionuclide testing is really the least specific um, and the least likely to localize a leak. It may give you a clue to do that there is a leak, but most centers uh, are not doing this anymore. So how do I think about all of this? And again, it's kind of different depending on where you are and what resources you have available to you. Could you try conservative management? Sure, um, especially if you see the patient early on. Strict bed rest, Caffeine, just like you would do for post lumbar puncture headache. Um, ab abdominal binder is sometimes helpful. You increase the abdominal pressure, that you increase the pressure in the head. Um, elevate the foot of the bed, so the patient's basically in Trendelenburg at home. Um, I've had people buy inversion tables and use them. Uh, lots of hydration, analgesics, maybe a course of steroids. You can even try a greater occipital nerve block. Sometimes that's helpful for spinal headache. Sometimes it's helpful for this. But Overall, conservative management does not have a high yield, especially if you're seeing patients down the line. Um, after that, if I have a high clinical suspicion, I'll give the patients stuff to read. I'll talk to them about the disorder and I'll send them home with information to read, uh, along with resources where they can get other information. Because sometimes the questions we ask are just so strange. It, they're things that they've never really talked thought about, right? So they go home, they read about it, and they start paying attention to their symptoms, and they're like, yeah, you know, you're right. I think maybe I have this. Or maybe you're wrong. I don't think I have it at all. Okay, next is a brain MRI with contrast. Now, this can go one of two ways. If it's abnormal, you could go ahead and do a blood patch, a non-targeted blood patch. We'll talk about those in a second. If it's normal and you have a high suspicion, you could also do a blood patch. Okay? You don't have to do spinal imaging to do a non-targeted blood patch. These are done in the upper lumbar, lower thoracic area. They're right on the midline. 
and the, they're going to inject a volume of the patient's blood. Um, if it's abnormal and you're ready to pursue other imaging, then you could either go to heavily T2-weighted MRI, it's non-invasive, that's a nice advantage, or CT myelography. Um, and then if you need to go farther, uh, well, if you find something, then the patient can get targeted blood patches. Um, and these are used, these are done with fibrin sealants, and I'll talk in detail uh, in a couple minutes about those. And then the next step would be digital subtraction myelography. And if you find a leak, then the patient can actually get it fixed, uh, assuming that you can't patch it and fix it. Um, so you might have to take down a disc that's, you know, basically like a, a little spear that's puncturing the dura from the ventral side. Um, they may have to have um, just repair of the dural defect, which they go in and they patch usually with muscle or fat. Um, dural reduction surgery is basically like taking in the side seams of the dura in the lumbar space. Um, it makes the lumbar space smaller. Um, it decreases the elasticity of the lumbar dura. Um, so um, if we can't really find the leak, sometimes that is a good procedure to do. Um, or as we'll talk about, embolizing a fistula. Um, okay, so epidural blood patch. The first time it's done, most radiologists will um, do between 10 and 20 mLs. If they're brave, they may do more. Um, the patient, it's their own blood, it's taken out of their own arm, and it's injected into their, uh, again, upper lumbar or lower thoracic space. Um, if they need to come back after having temporary improvement, then often we'll try to get more blood in. Um, there was a study that was actually done at UT Southwestern um, that showed that uh, reviewing the literature and reviewing their own practice, that the magic number was 20 mLs, that you're much likely or to get a better result if you can get at least 20 mLs in. Um, you should wait at least five days between patches, um, and this may do the trick or the effect may wear off and the patient may need to get patched again. How does it work? Well, we're not sure. Um, you know, the simplistic idea that I no longer tell anybody is that that blood, it travels up the epidural space and it finds your leak and it seals it, right? Like fix a flat. Well, that's probably magical thinking. We know that the blood doesn't go all the way up your epidural space. It only goes a couple of spinal segments in each direction. So that's probably not how it works. Um, well, if you inject a large volume of blood, right, that bolus of blood is gonna compress the uh, dural sac, right? And maybe that is what is increasing the pressure in the system above it. Um, and maybe that's why it works or maybe compressing the dural sac decreases the volume in the spinal space and increases this pressure. Or what I really think is the answer um, is that the blood adheres to the dura and the dura down in the lower uh, lumbar space uh, has, a, it's what we call it, it's more compliant than the dura higher up in the lumbar space. Compliant means elastic, right? Um, so if the dura is kind of saggy and elastic, which it tends to be, especially in the presence of a leak, and you put this sticky blood around it, uh, and you make it less elastic, then that may increase the pressure in the system. Or maybe we just don't know. Um, okay, what about targeted blood patches? So if you have a suspected site when you do your spinal imaging, um, or actually a known site, um, then you can do targeted patches. What we call it fibrin glue. It's really a fibrin sealant. Um, it's actually used off label too, I think. Um, but it, it's beneficial in about a third of people in whom a non-targeted blood patch doesn't work. Um, so again, done under either fluoroscopy guidance or CT guidance. Um, and for people who have ventral leaks, it's a little harder to get the, um, the fibrin sealant, which is mixed with a little bit of blood. Um, into that space, but it is possible to target a uh, ventral leak. And then lastly, the patient could go to surgery. So they may have ligation of that diverticulum that's leaking um, or ligation of the, or, or clamping of the fistula, um, either suturing the ventral leak, patching the ventral leak, removing the, the, the disc that's pressing into the dura um, or endovascular treatment. Um, this was a study that was uh, done to look at the yield of various imaging tests to determine a leak. Um, and it's, uh, it's got a fair amount of bias in it, like all of our research does. 
Uh, but they found that the most successful imaging technique was lateral decubitus digital subtraction myelography. Now the end for that was in this study was pretty low, followed by just regular DSM with the patient in the prone position, followed by uh, MR myelography with intrathecal gadolinium. Um, and then you can see that the yield goes down as far as finding a specific leak, um, but sometimes they show unspecified changes. Um, <clears throat> Until about 2018, we thought that CSF venous fistulas were incredibly rare. Like there was a study that uh, Shevink's group did showing that they accounted for about 3.5% of all leaks way back when. But when we started doing digital subtraction myelography and putting patients in the lateral decubitus position, uh, the most recent paper for, by his group showed that it accounts for about a quarter of people with CSF leaks. Um, and uh, so, you know, how hard should we really look? <laughs> this was a study that they did where they looked at people who had a great clinical story, right? They had orthostatic headache, but they had normal brain imaging and normal conventional spine imaging. Um, and uh, their, their duration of symptoms was anywhere from a month to 180 months. And of the 60 patients they studied, 10% of them had had fistulas that they found. So I guess, you know, the, the thing is, don't give up. If your imaging is negative, if your conventional imaging is negative, don't give up because there will be patients that turn out to have a leak on more sophisticated imaging or even on repeat imaging. Um, there's a score that came out uh, from Burn, so it's called the Burn score. Uh, and what they tried to do looking at CT myelography was determine whether there were factors on the brain MRI that could help predict whether the patient would have a leak on their CT myelogram. So they developed a scoring system uh, and they tested it in patients who had leaks um, and they also had sort of a control group. Um, and here is what they found. So this is their scoring system. Um, and a lot of neuroradiologists are now incorporating this into their reports for CT myelography. Um, and I, I would actually encourage them to do this because some of these metrics actually involve doing measurements on the CT and on the brain MRI, not just looking at it and say, well, I think that looks normal. I think that looks abnormal. Okay, so the major criteria that got the score of two were pachymeningeal enhancement, venous sinus engorgement, and effacement of the supracellar cistern to four millimeters or less. Supracellar cistern is that little white space over there above the cella. You see this patient has a big pituitary. Um, so that has to be measured, okay? Um, the minor criteria, some of them I thought were surprising. Um, subdural fluid collection, uh, effacement of the prepontine cistern, which is the one over here to less than five millimeters, um, and mammalopontine distance. This is the mammillary bodies over here to the pons. Uh, so that has to be less than 6.5 millimeters, and those all get one point each. Um, so patients who scored less than two based on their brain MRI had a very low probability of finding a leak on CT myelography, um, and those who scored over five had a very high probability of finding a leak on CT myelography, and you can see the sensitivity and the specificity. So their conclusions from their paper um, show that the scoring system really is helpful, um, particularly if it's positive. I would say not so particularly if it's negative. But my comment is, we as neurologists, those are not the people we see, okay? Um, so 37 out of their 60 patients had subdural fluid collections. Most people, at least in my practice, I don't see a lot of subdural fluid collections. Those go to neurosurgery, right? Um, Pachymeningeal enhancement, yes, we see that. Um, superficial siderosis, that is super, super rare. So five of their 60 patients had superficial siderosis. So I'm not sure that this really applies to the world at large with SIH, but in their experience, that's what they found. Um, and the group at Mayo did a similar study, but this time, instead of using CT myelography, they used the burn score for lateral decubitus um, digital subtraction myelography. Um, so this was a retrospective study. They did not include patients they had seen with what they call type one leaks, which just means 
there's a hole in the dura and the fluids leaking out in the epidural space. They were specifically looking for patients who had fistulas. Um, and so they had different pools of mask readers um, and they found that the um, most common brain abnormalities that were predictive were again, the venous sinus engorgement, the pachymeningeal enhancement um, and subdural fluid collections. So similar to what the burn group found with CT myelography. Um, and of their patients, uh, those who had a score less than two, there were only nine of them. None of them had a leak uh, on lateral decubitus sub digital subtraction myelography. Um, those who had a high score above five, five or more, um, two thirds had a leak. Um, and then those are intermediate, about half had a leak. Um, so there, you know, you, you can use the burn score and I do recommend the burn score, but all of the papers also say you should take into account the clinical scenario. Uh, and one of my colleagues who will remain unnamed, but he has been named by me the past uh, half an hour, um, says the best predictive value for finding a leak is what the referring neurologist says. If the referring neurologist thinks there's a leak, then chances are the patient has a leak. I thought that was pretty cool. All right, so their conclusions were the CSF venous fistula, it was the most common type that they saw. Um, the spinal MRI was not very sensitive for detecting that, which we knew before. Um, patients who had that uh, brain MRI or clinical findings suspicious for SIH and a negative spinal MRI or conventional CT myelogram may require a lateral decubitus DSM. Um, patients with a low burn scar are unlikely to benefit unless there is a high clinical suspicion. And I just emphasize this because a lot of radiologists have kind of come away with the take home message that if there's a low burn score, it's not worth doing anything else. And that's not true. Um, one third of patients with a high burn score have a negative lateral decubitus DSM. So it's not perfect either. Um, and there were some limitations to their study. Um, kind of the newest thing in treatment is endovascular therapy for CSF venous fistula. So, you know, we used to, they used to clip them, the neurosurgeries would clip them. Uh, but this was a study that came out of the Mayo Clinic up in Rochester. Um, and it was their, their first publication where they did endovascular treatment of um, CSF venous fistulas. Uh, so basically, they access the, um, either the femoral vein or the jugular vein they advanced a catheter up through the superior vena cava, which you can see over here. Um, they then threaded a little glide wire into the azagous vein and used a microcatheter to catheterize the paraspinal uh, draining vein um, and then injected onyx, uh, which was used to embolize the uh, fistulas and it worked. Um, and we actually uh, had a case at UT Southwestern that patient who was a, a baggage handler at the airport, that's probably how he got his uh, leak. And um, he uh, had a T67 fistula that he had clipped. And then he did well for several years and then his symptoms returned. And we found that he had a leak at exactly the same level on the other side and we embolized it and he did very well. Um, so some of the take home messages here, first of all, blood patches are often successful. So don't be afraid to do them. I know sometimes we have trouble convincing our colleagues in radiology and anesthesiology that this patient really needs a blood patch, um, but be persistent. Um, the bigger the volume, the more likely it is to have success. The findings on a brain MRI can help predict the likelihood of finding a leak on spinal imaging, but exceptions do occur. And at the moment, at this moment in time, uh, there may be better things on the horizon. DSM with lateral decubitus views best detect venous fistulas. There's actually new CT technology that may rival DSM. Um, endovascular treatment, you know, can decrease the need of surgery for some patients. So how do these people do? It's just a tough problem. Um, it's tough for the patient, it's tough for us too. Many of these patients require multiple or repeated procedures and imaging, because just because you didn't find it the first time doesn't mean you're not going to find it the second time. Maybe they weren't leaking when they were in the scanner the first time. Um, people who have joint mobility, hypermobility may be more prone to develop subsequent leaks in the future. Um, so they may need to modify their activity. Uh, rebound intracranial hypertension can occur. Um, and so after you seal the leak, you have to be ready for this to happen. 
um, especially in anybody who's obese that you think might have had pseudotumor cerebri to begin with. Um, but this can occur even non, in non-obese patients. Um, so sometimes we have to treat the high pressure symptoms and get them sort of back to a, a steady state. Um, the uh, CSF Leak Foundation funded a study that we did at UT Southwestern and actually the first author, Victor uh, Liao, was, is a medical student. If there are any medical, medical students in the room or, or on uh, watching on video, I hope this inspires you. Um, so we did a cross-sectional survey to look at quality of life in our patients. Um, and it, unlike other studies that were done elsewhere, like in Europe, we looked at two different groups. One group was patients who had a confirmed leak and the other group was, were patients that we clinically suspected of having a leak, but we couldn't prove it, okay? Um, and then 73 out of those 96 patients, after being treated, they still had persistent symptoms. Um, and what we found was that this is not, not a good disease to have. These people are pretty miserable. Uh, so this is part one of our study, actually. Uh, headache disability was significant. 75% um, of people scored within the most severe headache category on the headache impact test. They filled out questionnaires. Um, about 50% scored in the moderate depression range or worse um, using the PHQ-9. Um, on the uh, GAD-7 anxiety score, lower than I thought, 25% uh, 20 scored for moderate or worse anxiety. Um, but the, th the other thing that we did that was a little different was we interviewed patients for suicidality. And people had to volunteer to, be, to do this. Um, and so there were not 96 patients, there were 67 patients that agreed to be interviewed using the Columbia suicide screening uh, rating system. Um, and so they, it was rather impactful what we found. 62% um, had previously endorsed a wish to be dead, uh, and 22% had previously demonstrated, demonstrated suicidal behavior. Um, and uh, nobody's looked really at this before, but it's up there with cluster headache. Uh, it's worse than MS, uh, and it's worse than, well, uh, I don't know if anybody's looked at it in IIH, um, but it, it was pretty astounding. Uh, to find out about suicidality. And granted, you know, this may be a bias of the 67 patients that agreed to talk to us. Um, but the other thing that was very striking was no matter what metric we looked at, the patients who had a confirmed diagnosis scored the same as the patients who had a suspected diagnosis, okay? So this is a very, very impactful, life-changing problem for people. So final conclusions, consider this in patients who have new daily persistent headache or those who you think have refractory chronic migraine. Normal MRI of the brain with contrast um, or LP opening pressure doesn't exclude the diagnosis. For some reason that slide didn't show up. I do not recommend getting a spinal tap, okay? If the patient, because that can make the patient worse. And chances are good that their, their pressure is gonna be normal. So if, when the patient goes for myelography, they can measure the pressure. But just doing a routine spinal, spinal tap is not necessary. Um, the symptoms are really variable and you really have to be a detective and ask a lot of questions. And a lot of times, no matter how hard we look, we don't find the leak. Hopefully those days are gonna end soon. Um, CT or MR myelography is usually the first choice for spinal imaging. You need a team. This is a team uh, sport. You need a team of neuroradiologists, a team of neurosurgeons, uh, and it's difficult to put the team together. I will tell you from experience, you know, not everybody's interested in this problem, um, but you, you need to have a great relationship with your neuroradiologist for sure, um, because these patients need very specialized imaging and they need people to look and read their imaging who are comfortable and confident about the findings. Again, because this is just not something that neuroradiologists or non-neuroradiologists non see every day. And it's a process and the patients are relying on you, so don't give up. So that is all I have. Thank you. I am happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, great talk, Dr. Freeman. Thank you very much. Um, two questions. Do them one at a time and I'll put it in the microphone so everybody can hear. 
That's okay. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, the director of Treasury takes yes. the cognitive issues. Did they improve with cognitive uh, issues once treated? Okay, the question is what happened to the guy who was the director of Treasury who had the cognitive problems? This is a really sad story. So he was followed, like I said, for at least two years in the memory clinic before anybody did anything. And um, we, we did not find a leak, which is typical of those patients. So this frontotemporal dementia that people get with a spinal fluid leak, often we don't find a leak in those patients. I'm not really sure why. Um, he went out to Cedar sinai and he had dural reduction surgery, if I remember this right. Um, and he got a little better and he gradually, gradually improved over time. And I just kept sending him back every three months for blood patches because every time he had a blood patch, he would get a little better. So he's no longer, actually he's much better than he was, uh, which was sitting in the chair, not talking. <laughs> now he has a conversation and it's been several years since this all happened. I think it was all pre-COVID. Um, but he's, he's up, he's around, he goes to the store by himself, he's mowing the lawn, he's, you know, can have a conversation with you. He's dramatically better than he was, but he's not what he used to be. Great. The, the second question was um, blood pressure management. Does that parallel CSF pressure at all? Is there anything that we need to know or do there? Blood pressure management? Um, not that I'm aware of. A, of. I've never heard anything about blood pressure management. But you know, it's sometimes hard to tell if the patient has a CSF leak or whether they have POTS because the symptoms are very similar. Um, so that's a whole other kind of path that we often have to go down is to get them evaluated for POTS and see if there is something going on you know, with their orthostatic regulation of their blood pressure that is contributing. Any other questions? Thank you. Technical consultation here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for a great talk. I'm wondering, um, do you ever run into, and I know this is a much rarer uh, manifestation of CSF leak, but uh, sort of a CSF leak mimicking motor neuron disease, do you have much experience with that where, you know, there's a, um, a CSF leak that creates pressure and then generates sort of a progressive weakness either in the upper or lower extremities. I've run across it like once, I found very little in the literature and just as someone who Sorry, wasn't on my list. sees a lot of this, I'm wondering if you have any insight that you can share about how that happens, how that presents, um, how you end up with sort of pure motor deficits as a result of I'm that. I'm not sure what the pathophysiology is, but yes, it definitely can occur. It most typically causes a bibrachial amyotrophy, yeah. right? Um, so people get weakness in their arms and um, often is missed. Yeah. So thank you, good point. Thank you so much for that great talk, Dr. Friedman. I have a number of questions that were submitted virtually. Uh, the first one is by uh, Robert Layson. Uh, he says uh, that he saw a lot of patients with post-operative CSF leaks over 32 years, and he did not see any variety of symptoms described um, by, by your talk. What is the difference? Should every patient with any headache get tested for IIH? IIH or SIH? He said IIH. Okay. Um, Post-surgical leaks, I think most commonly cause orthostatic headache. Um, but I don't know why they couldn't cause any of the other symptoms. And if the patient has, it's one of those things that you want to know about if, they, if you're seeing the patient, do they have a history of spinal surgery? Um, because people can develop, you know, dural defects after the surgery and it can cause a similar clinical picture. Um, can you repeat the last part about the IIH? Uh, yeah. Sorry, some technical issues here. Okay, technical issues. Okay. I mean, I would consider IIH, I think the thing that really helps you to determine whether they initially had IIH is the, um, the, the brain MRI, the presenting brain MRI, because chances are you're going to see either an empty cella or something else on the brain MRI that, that will give you a clue. Yeah, this one. Or if they have persistent rebound intracranial hypertension after you fix their leak or give them a blood patch, mm -hmm. um, then they, I, I would look a little more carefully at those patients. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the, the second part he just said, uh, should every patient with any headache get tested for IIH? 
I don't think any patient with any headache should be evaluated for IIH. Um, IIH is a different story, mm. different animal. Mm. Give me another hour, I'll talk to you about it. Uh, also by uh, Robert, um, he says, by the way, he saw a number of patients with IIH secondary to occult leaks in the thoracic spine. Their symptoms were quite typical. What is he missing? What is what? What is he missing, he asks. I'm sorry, I still didn't understand. I can't hear you. Uh, what is he missing? I I'm not sure. Uh, uh, and if, does, you re does he really mean IIH with occult leaks or SIH with occult leaks? It's this word, you know, alphabet soup. I'm yeah. sorry. I, yeah. I wish I could help you out. Yeah. Well, we can uh, go on to another question then. Let's see. So this is, um, let me just go on to, to another person. If you can scroll down. Uh, OK, so this is from Ahmad um, Faraz. Uh, do you recommend VP shunt? Not for SIH. I try not to ever do it for IIH. <laughs> <laughs> They're just, you know, for IIH, I find that they, they tend to fail. They don't really work well long term. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a road that I try not to go down unless yeah. the patient's losing their vision right yeah. before my eyes. Oh, and um, Robert Lassen corrected himself. He meant SIH. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I think there were some more questions. Is there more questions, or, or is that it? I think okay. that's it. That's it. Okay. Oh, there's two more questions. Um, okay. So Elizabeth Spoconi, um, she asks that. Uh, okay, wait. Actually, you know, this is this is more of a statement. Okay. Mm, all right. I. Yeah, I think that's all the online questions. Um, I have one question, actually. Um, is there any downside or any dangers of repeated blood patches? In general, repeated blood patches are very safe. Rarely, okay, they can cause radicular pain. They can cause um, abnormal, like they, the blood adheres to the dura and you, get, you can get arachnoiditis. Um, but that's not very common. And I think you really have to look at the risks and the benefits. And the way I talk to my patients about this is, you know, you're pretty miserable. You can't get out of bed. You can't work, right? I mean, a lot of these people, they just cannot function. Um, so which is worse, right? Um, and there's a good chance that it could make you better. So in a lot of cases, I think there's not much to lose. And really, the risk is very low. And generally, if patients get the radicular pain, it goes away over time. So, Great. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was really a pleasure. And um, y'all have a great day.